uh, today I'm going to tell you about my functional startup uh, with Closure, pun somewhat intended. I think we're generally functional uh, and certainly built on a functional language. Um, would be useful. I can only do the show of hands in this room, uh, but would be useful nonetheless. Uh, I'm assuming general kind of, I've heard of Closure before, but not much more than that. Does that fit you? Uh, <laughs> resounding yes, uh, at, least, uh, at least in this room. So um, I'm not going to teach you Closure today. I'm not going to say Closure versus this other functional language. I'm just going to talk about uh, what happens when you decide to start a company and choose functional technology. Um, that's it. So let's talk about the company first. Uh, the company is called Amparity. We were started a little bit more than two years ago uh, with nothing, no lines of code, no nothing. So it was a completely blank slate company, relatively recent, relatively um, you know, modern in, in terms of uh, our approach. This is our office dog in our office. So as you can see, we are a startup because the picture I'm choosing to show you has a dog in it. Um, and this is what we do in case it's not obvious from context. Uh, uh, what we do is we help customers with really large amounts of customer data um, link customer identity together and do interesting things so that they can drive better customer experience, better marketing, um, et cetera. So uh, if you were a very large consumer brand and you had uh, hundreds of millions of pieces of customer information, uh, it didn't all link perfectly. It wasn't sort of a big group buy and join problem. Uh, but actually you had sort of some, some nuance and you had to sort of build this probabilistic identity graph um, across all of that data, uh, which, is, which is certainly an at scale uh, challenging problem. Uh, you know, we're, we would be a, a, good, uh, a good company to call. Um, uh, the company uh, is doing well. And, 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 and I mentioned um, the, the funding, not because I think that's necessarily uh, an indicator that we're doing well, but uh, it's important to highlight that we are building a functional startup uh, but we're building a functional startup with the intention uh, a very significant scale, right? So, um, you know, we have or have had uh, $37 million hit our bank account. Uh, and so this is not an experiment. This isn't a, let's see how functional goes. We're, we're really, you know, making a huge bet on this. Uh, and if we're wrong, uh, we're going to be wrong to the tune of, of some pretty, pretty serious uh, uh, dollar amounts. And I'm going to get like really fired, like dramatically fired. Um, uh, if functional doesn't work out. So, uh, so it's an important decision for us and, and, and we're trying to build this company for scale. So it's not a short-term decision for us either. It's not sort of let's bootstrap on this and then go somewhere else. Um, now, with all that said, uh, we're a startup and when you're a startup, you have to choose a language, right? You start with nothing. And so that's one of the, uh, one of the decisions you have to make. And, and there's sort of like the default menu of options. There's the, there's the things you're expected to consider because you're a startup. And there's other considerations that, that people assume when you're a startup, like you're gonna build the whole thing over a weekend and then you're gonna hack at it for a while. And then uh, you know, eventually you're gonna realize that you've created this big ball of garbage and you're gonna throw it all out and start over with some new language, right? So the, the sort of you know, classic startup models, you do it in Ruby and then you switch to Java. Um, or, or, you know, insert different languages there, but there's sort of your, this notion of you have a go fast language and then you have a real language, an enterprise language, when you actually have to hire people and you have people in their 30s working for you or whatever the, uh, uh, whatever the, um, uh, the perception is. And this sort of gets reinforced, I think, in, um, in social media, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, Twitter used Ruby and it was awful and failing all the time. And then they used Java and everything was, um, was awesome and amazing. Um, and, you know, I think that's an oversimplification, but certainly this is uh, an assumption people make and, and, and it's a common pattern. And if I had told people, if I had told these investors who wrote us big checks, hey, we're going to use Python uh, until it stops working and then we'll start using uh, Java or C Sharp or whatever the, the kind of, you know, blub language of the day uh, is, they would say, sounds great. Um, that's what everybody does. So that must work. So uh, if you were starting a company. Uh, how many of you would confidently say, I would definitely, I would definitely start this company with a functional language? I assume because you're here, I'd see some hands. All right. How many of you like, ah, maybe? Okay. So we've got, we've got a pretty split in the room. How many are like, no way. I would not have started a company with a functional language. Too much risk. Okay. So nobody's, nobody's, completely, uh, nobody's completely against it. Uh, for those who would, or those who, who maybe are, are, are in the gray area between maybe and, and would, uh, I'd love to hear interactively um, what some of the reasons would be. Why would you choose a functional language versus some other choice 
uh, when you're starting your startup, sort of day one of a startup? Anybody? Just throw it out. Cleaner code. Um, point, point made that uh, who are your employees? Do you have scientific employees? What are, they, what are they comfortable with? Definitely a consideration. In my case, I hadn't hired anybody yet, so I could decide. <laughs> Use that as a filter. Better abstraction. Okay. Um, so yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these things I expected to, to maybe hear simplicity, maybe testability, comprehensibility. I think that's maybe that cleaner code argument I heard. Um, maybe it's more fun because you're doing something other people aren't doing. Um, uh, maybe you just want to scare away all those corporate programmers. I'm not sure. Um, but these are all kind of, uh, you know, reasons why, why somebody might, might choose a functional language. We'll talk about why, uh, why closure, um, as we go on, but, uh, but these are sort of things in your head when you're starting a company and it's, and it's day zero and you haven't made this decision yet, making the language decision is important. Um, but I'd also like to take a step back and just like set a little bit of context, right? I, I realize I'm maybe not making friends here at a functional programming conference by telling you all the things that are way more important than functional programming. Um, but I think it's important just to, to have this in the back of our head, right? So what matters more than functional programming? Well, you have to know what you're doing. You have to have some sort of a decent idea, not that it's going to be the perfect idea and you're never going to change, but, uh, you know, functional programming done well is not going to save you from a bad idea. If you're just doing the wrong thing, that's not going to work. Not unrelated to that fact, you need some sort of a customer. Um, depending on the type of co the company that you are, you might have a different notion of what a customer is, but I would argue, uh, you know, having customers and not having functional programming is a better formula than not having customers and having functional programming. Um, not unrelated to that, you need revenue, right? You need to, to build a, a business that's actually going to get to sustainability. You need operational excellence. If you have a, a bunch of um, fancy functional code and it doesn't run when your customers need it, uh, it's, it's not uh, doing you any good. I would argue company culture is more important than your language choice. Now, company culture might be a little bit shaped by your language choice, so I don't think they're completely independent. Um, but, you know, if everybody hates showing up for work, even if they have a great language and a great stack and they all love the technology, you're probably not going to build a, a great product and you're certainly not going to build a great company. Um, and of course, people are the, are the essence of the company. That's why it's in bold. Um, and I would argue system architecture. And, 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 and I make this, uh, this point, you know, especially given that it's 2018, system architectures are more complicated than they were, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. And so I think actually this affects uh, the role of language uh, in, in your stack. I think when you're thinking about the language, um, you know, once upon a time, your system architecture was sort of, well, you've got a big stack of code. And so code was all there was. And so that decision um, sort of drove everything. But when you consider a modern sort of microservices-y uh, system architecture, the trade-offs are very different, right? And I would argue uh, that language uh, matters less and functional matters less. You're dominated by the complexity of your architecture when you start breaking things apart. Make sense? So closure, we chose closure. Um, and uh, I, I, from the poll earlier, I realized that there's not a lot of closure experts. So just real quick, uh, what closure is, and I'm not even going to show you any closure. Um, closure is a, a dynamic functional lisp that runs on the JVM. Uh, and there's a variant that's quite popular called ClojureScript that runs uh, on JavaScript engines, um, mostly in the browser, but also um, if you prefer um, on, on the server side. So, you know, if you're familiar with Scala, you know, that you could consider Clojure as having some of the same benefits, at least in terms of interoperability directly with the, uh, the Java ecosystem. Uh, and when I say, uh, you know, we chose to, to use Clojure and we chose to build a, a functional startup at Amparity, um, I really mean it. Uh, I actually took this screenshot yesterday, so it's up to date. Um, so this is, you know, 27,000 commits, uh, 23 people uh, who've, who've written code. Um, we're using a mono repo, which makes it very easy to aggregate the statistics. You just go to GitHub and, uh, and screenshot it. And uh, just shy of 90% uh, of our code uh, in our um, core system repository is in Clojure. Um, that includes Clojure Script, uh, so we have a you know reason, reasonably sized front end. Um, but we're really doing this. This isn't sort of we've got this special ops team in the back room doing some Clojure stuff, and everyone else is using Java. This is like we're doing Clojure. Um, so why Clojure, right? So so we talked about some of the reasons to, to do functional, but I'm going to incorporate that into um, the specific choice to use Clojure. Question. Closure for yes. Not JavaScript, but actually 
Oh, you use. Okay. Yeah. You use Clojure also for the um for the front end for for like instead of Angular or React, you use you, uh, you build the UI in. Yes, asterisk. So um so yes, we use Clojure on the front end. Uh, and we use Clojure exclusively on the front end. In terms of the code that we write, um, it's all written in Clojure Script. That's not an instead of React. So we use React and we use Clojure Script. So, um, so, so as with Clojure on the JVM, uh, Clojure Script uh, in the JavaScript ecosystem um, has you know sort of tight interoperability with the existing ecosystems that we can use the best pieces of that. So um, we use uh, React and the specific sort of library that uh, or framework that we use is called Reframe um, that kind of wraps a, a programming model um, around React and some other technology from the JavaScript ecosystem. Does that make sense? Well, I have you also use a lot of Java libraries in the background? Tons, boatloads. Yeah, one of the great things about being on the JVM is there's so much ecosystem there. So, so yeah, absolutely, we use that. And, and we don't just use the, the, the code assets, we also use other aspects. And this is sort of, um, sort of the way of doing things in the Clojure ecosystem. You use Maven, for example. And so, you know, those things get fetched from Maven Central and you have sort of the same, uh, the same thing. So if you, you know, if you're coming from Java and you understand how class paths and Maven work, like that gives you a pretty good um, head start on, on, on Clojure. Of course, same would, same would apply to something like Scala. So specifically, um, why Clojure versus any other functional language and, and why Clojure versus any other language, period. Um, uh, so it's pretty simple. I had three really primary thoughts in my head in terms of, well, why make this, why make this bet? Um, one, it's got this nice blend between dynamism and performance. So think back to sort of like what all startups do stereotypically, right? Like, well, I bang it out over a weekend in Ruby and I hack on that for two years until it's uh, uh, untenable. And then I throw it all away and I start over, um, right? That's the sort of benefit of something that's dynamic, right? It lets you move really fast and incrementally and kind of build, build, build. Um, and that's important when you're a startup because you have nothing, you have no revenue and you have to make a product before you get to revenue. So moving fast really matters a whole lot. Um, and so that dynamism, uh, helps us move fast. The REPL orientation helps us to move fast, but it's performant, right? So we're not taking a you know 10 or 20x performance hit when we do that, right? We're able to use existing ecosystem uh, when you're when you're writing closure in cases where it's helpful. You can type hint things, and you can get uh, awfully close to what I'll call native performance, where native uh, uh, in this case is is sort of similar to if you'd hand wrote, written some some Java, uh, but with all of that dynamism. So it's almost like you know, if you think about it, you kind of have a knob you can turn where it's like, you know, in this part of the code, I want to move really, really fast. So I'm going to I'm going to write the code in a very dynamic way. And in this other part, performance matters. So I might drop down, um, spend more time on performance, but you don't kind of have to throw it all out and start over. You have that knob dynamically in any part of the code um, down to sort of the line of code. Yeah, question. Oh, I'm sorry. If this is a dumb question. What do you mean by dy uh, dynamic? Yes. Okay. Um, what do I mean by dynamic? I guess there's 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 different ways to answer that, but uh, uh, it doesn't have a strict typing system. So you get dynamic dispatch, which uh, uh, which means and and does that make sense? I'm using some five dollar words here, but um, uh, so basically what that means is uh, I don't have to declare types. I can just write code without explicitly declaring types, and whatever the types are will just sort of flow through, um, and it'll work or it'll not work. And uh, another way of looking at that is you're going to get errors at runtime instead of compile time because uh, uh, you're not necessarily compiling. Um, now, Closure does, I'm not going to get into any detail on sort of the language level. Closure does have some facilities to um, either write actual typed closure. There's something, um, there's a project specifically for typed closure, um, which isn't immensely popular. Um, there's also uh, sort of, you know, kind of analogous to a type system in, in, in something called um, uh, Closure Spec, uh, which allows you to write pretty rich specifications for the shape of data that's kind of analogous to wanting to enforce some level of structure or scheme on types. Um, so you have options to sort of, you know, uh, uh, get away from everything is just, you know, whatever it is at, at runtime, but certainly it is, it is dynamic in the same way that a Ruby or a Python is dynamic in that you're not um, forced to declare types. Make sense? Um, it is simple and data oriented. And, and, and for those who, who know a lot about closure, simple is a very, um, is a very closurey word because uh, the founder of of, uh, of of closure has some pretty strong opinions on what the word simple means, um, and in particular, um, the the focus on on simple in the closure world is is not kind of all tangled together, right? So so closure is very much about taking different pieces um, and and breaking them apart that can operate on on whatever. That's very closely related to uh, the notion of being data oriented. So 
Um, you know, you might imagine if you've ever worked on a, on a system that, that started small and simple and got larger, um, I'm willing to bet that there was some part of that system um, that had a class or some very specific structure with a type. Maybe you had, you know, customer.java or customer.cs and it said a customer has a first name and a last name and everything was simple. And then you started to, to build that application over time and you realize, wow, people need to customize this. And then you ended up with some hash table in there somewhere that said other attributes. And then you created your own, uh, you know, uh, depending on the era, XML or JSON based metadata system to describe all the attributes. And so you, you invented your runtime type system um, that was supposed to, to complement your other type system. And then at some point you said, why are there these types here to begin with? This is really annoying and it's just making our lives more complicated. So um, that's maybe an overblown way of illustrating the point, but um, in closure, you just kind of start with that attributes view. Um, it's just data, and, and the simplicity is, is about closure offering you many, many tools out of the box um, uh, to just operate on those things as data. And this is very much, I, I think, in the spirit of you know functional style and functional techniques. I think closure um, certainly is very opinionated about the the particular ways that that's done. Um, one of the really key benefits of this, um, this isn't just sort of a philosophical thing, is that you have less code. Right, so if you have one piece of code that can operate on just about any data structure that you throw it, um, that code is inherently gonna be far more reusable. And of course, the other goodness of functional programming, first class functions, the ability to pass those things around, um, obviously um, contributes to that as well. So, so I would say, and I don't have any direct comparisons, but I would, I would just sort of hand wave and say a closure code base is typically going to be much, much smaller um, than say a Java code base. Um, uh, where there's kind of a lot of boilerplate and much, much, much less data orientation, and in fact, quite the opposite. And last and, and absolutely not least, um, uh, arguably even the most important consideration is uh, I firmly believed and, and, and still remain steadfast in the belief that smart people want to use closure. Uh, and that's really important. If you're starting a company from scratch, your probability of success is pretty low by the numbers. And, um, and one of the best things you can do to increase your odds is to get some really, really smart people uh, who want to work on your team and help you build your company. So, um, you know, if the language that you choose is going to attract those smart people, you're going to improve your odds. Um, I think that's not controversial. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I was going to say, which of those points distinguish Clojure from, say, Scala, which you can program in a functional manner on the JVM? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, um, if it didn't come through the mic, um, well, why Closure but but not Scala? Um, so I think the the knob that you have is 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 unique to Closure. You've got the dynamism. Um, I think uh, you know Scala uh, Scala can be data oriented. There's sort of you have to agree on that style. Um, uh, I have um, I don't have deep and rich experience with with Scala, but having toured some Scala code bases and navigated some things that I'm interrupting with in, in Scala, there are different ways to do Scala. Um, so I think there's a little bit less sort of, you know, if somebody's coming in and they're like, I love clothes, you sort of know um, what their what their style is. And Scala, I think, is a little bit more flexible. You can do it in different ways. And that's not a bad thing. I want to be super clear. Um, it's just it's more flexible. So um, there's there's a little bit more to do. I, I think um, number three, I think smart people do want to use Scala and Scala was certainly something that was a primary consideration. And, and to be honest, I think if we'd chosen Scala, the company wouldn't be in a dramatically different place. I think that um, that could have worked just fine. So, um, so this is not, uh, uh, closer doesn't mean better. Um, it just means, um, it just means something that, that, that worked for us. Um, last, last point I'll make on, I just want to add, add one extra piece of nuance on the data orientation. Um, the data orientation in closure has the benefits that I articulated. It also has the mindset benefit of building a data oriented product. So what our company does, what our product does is it takes data and mixes it together um, in a very flexible way, right? Different customers are gonna have some overlap in the way they do things, but there's a lot of customizability and configurability. So the style of how you build a system like that where you have a lot of flexibility, kind of back to that example where you have that static customer class and then a bunch of attributes, right? Um, when you're building things that are configurable, you're much closer to that just a bunch of attributes, especially when you have kind of multiple different types that relate to each other. So that's a very data oriented way of thinking. And so somebody who comes in uh, in the closure mindset is going to sort of naturally see that and go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and again, that may be true for, for a large um, collection of, of Scala programmers as well. So this is absolutely not a statement of um, one being better than the other. Um, but closures worked for us. Um, so to double click on the on the smart people point, right? Um, so I want to be clear, and, and 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 I guess repeating what I just said, um, smart people want to use closure, but obviously there's 
very smart people who want to use all of these languages. Um, and you could make the argument that um, uh, since that's true, why choose Clojure? Because there's fewer smart people, right? Clojure is not uh, as popular as PHP or Java or Ruby or Go um, or, or some of these other languages, right? So, so if there's fewer smart people using Clojure, um, you know, isn't that a disadvantage? And, and, and yeah, I think in a, in a sense it is. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's fewer employers who've decided to bet their company on Clojure. So um, smaller pool, um, but there's also a smaller pool of companies competing with you for that top talent. Um, so the idea that we could be the most interesting company in the world using Clojure is not insane, right? We're not, we're not competing with household names. Um, uh, that's, that's actually a realistic thing. So if somebody really loves Clojure, why not us? Um, and, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's the other side of that trade-off. Um, this is probably true with a lot of functional languages, but uh, you know, when you're using a language that's less common, you evoke some passion. Uh, you evoke some, um, you know, some amount of dedication to the language that doesn't exist. This person works for us, uh, and they literally have closure tattooed on their, on their arm. Uh, that's valid closure. Uh, uh, so I guess I, I, I lied. I am going to show you some closure today. It's just going to be um, ink. Um, the other thing you have to consider when the pool is smaller, it's not all in one place, right? So this is sort of the, the heat map for closure programmers um, uh, across, the, uh, across the world. And you can see they're sort of everywhere. Um, and so uh, that limits your ability. We're in Seattle, closure programmers are everywhere. Um, that creates a little bit of a problem, right? So you've got the smaller hiring pool, but it's also very spread out. So um, that does make it more challenging to build a company that's gonna be entirely um, in one place. So, is there a question? Uh, I'm just curious. This question's about the graphic. Uh, yeah. oh, why so heavy in China? <laughs> You'll have to ask Google Trends that because I just typed closure and screenshotted it. So uh, there was no uh, scientific rigor um, behind why one country is, is, uh, is, is highlighted versus another. Just okay. to illustrate the point. Um, so if you're using Clojure, and, and, and again, I think much of what I'm saying about Clojure would apply to uh, making the same choice with any functional language. If you decided to start a company on Haskell, everything I've said so far um, is, is true. If you decided to, uh, to start a company with Scala, many of these same things are true. You have to uh, consider your policy on remote work uh, faster than you would if you were using Java, C Sharp, something mainstream where you know, there's thousands of people in the area who all know that technology and, and likely would be willing to, to work with it. So you lose some of those other advantages, but, uh, but you know, it makes it much easier to build um, a, a local startup. So you know, we pretty early on said, hey, we're gonna be pro remote. We're gonna be a headquarters centric company. Uh, and we're gonna be unapologetic about that because we think there's a lot of benefits, especially again, you're starting with nothing, right? There's a lot of conversations that happen to build from nothing. Um, and turn the blank canvas into uh, into something that you can sell to customers. But uh, but we said you know the the talents everywhere. We've got to be we we've got to be open to that. So um, since the early days of the company, we've had kind of a mixture between some folks uh, who are remote um, and some uh, and most people kind of being um, local. With that said, um, the technology investment you make to make it great to work as a remote employee at the company also works well for your local employees and. Um, that's true whether it's a snow day or you have some sort of a work from home day. It just gives you flexibility where um, not everybody needs to be in the same place. So I'd say it's a, it's a good investment regardless of where you stand on remote working. Um, we're very, very uh, uh, upfront with people who are working remote that there's a, a, a significant trade-off in terms of the, uh, the, the cultural elements and the team building. Um, startups are hard. Startups are also fun, right? You're in, engaged with uh, people who are all really dedicated and excited about what you're building. You're building... Um, you're building from scratch, you're, you know, uh, doing pivots left and pivots right, and there's all these sort of experiences that you go through together. And when you're remote, you kind of miss a lot of that. A lot of that stuff happens in the hallways, a lot of that stuff uh, happens on the walk to lunch or um, at happy hour after, uh, after work. So, um, so we're just very straightforward that, um, you know, when somebody signs on as a remote employee, you're getting a second class experience and, you know, <laughs> you're welcome to come by the office anytime, but um, that is the reality, and and uh, and I don't think technology can entirely um, get you out of that. There's just um, uh, there reasons there's reasons to be in person. You're all here, even though you could be watching at home uh, through this uh, through this blue jeans link. Um, so at some point, like what happens when the pool is exhausted, right? If you have a smaller number of people and you're growing really quickly. What if the people just don't know closure? Or what if you find somebody um, that you're really excited about that 
you know, uh, doesn't know closure, but, but otherwise seems like a great employee. Uh, well, it turns out you can just teach them closure. <laughs> it's, actually, it's not rocket science. Uh, and, and, and in fact, we've, um, uh, we've done this with, with our current team. So um, uh, approximately half of the people who've come onto our team uh, have no prior experience with closure. Um, and so, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I think smart people want to use closure. Again, that doesn't mean smart people already know closure. Um, so it's entirely fine if they don't know closure but want to use it. Now, it's very helpful if they have previous experience with some sort of a functional language. Uh, it's much easier to learn closure uh, coming from Scala than it would be coming from sort of a classic Java background, for example. So that's very helpful um, uh, because the hardest part of learning closure is kind of wrapping your head around how to program functionally, which I think has a lot of uh, a lot of commonalities across different environments. But sort of learning the syntax takes about um, 10 seconds. It's less, right? It's just, there's parentheses and that's it. Um, there's there's not much to learn beyond that. Um, so, so I would strongly encourage uh, anybody who's thinking about sort of starting a company or perhaps a team within a larger company, as as, uh, as some folks here are uh, are indulging in, to uh, uh, to embrace training people um, who are enthusiastic about learning the technology. It's it, it it works fine, and again, relative to the complexity that you deal with um, in an organization beyond the language, um, it's actually a pretty good investment. It's 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 easier. Um, so I highlighted people in system architecture. I want to really kind of talk about system architecture and, and, and hopefully emphasize the point that system architecture complexity um, is dominating language complexity. So uh, making the wrong system architecture choice is a much more impactful choice than, than making the wrong language choice. Um, and, and grossly oversimplifying, but uh, you know, when you're starting a startup, you sort of have to face this decision, especially for the early days. Do I want to build a monolith or do I want to build microservices, whatever that means? Um, building a monolith is faster, and I think that's that's probably a very uncontroversial um, thing to say uh, in the short term. If you want to go from zero to 100, build build a monolith. That's that's going to be the fastest way to get there. Um, there's so many decisions that ta that takes off the plate. But if you're building for durability, if you're thinking thinking long term, if you're thinking I don't want to throw this code base away and start over, I don't want to um, you know hit the pause button a year and a half or two years into the business and then start pulling things apart. Uh, you have to decide if you want to make that big investment. That's a tough thing to do when you're a startup um, because that's going to delay the time that it, it that is going to take you to get to market. Um, and that's important. You got to get to revenue to have a company. So uh, so if you walk down the microservices path, um, you have a bunch of decisions to make. And again, you've taken on all this complexity beyond all these things you were excited about in your functional language, whether that was closure or anything else. Um, you're about to get hit in the face with all of this complexity. So. First and foremost, you have to decide if we're going to have a microservices architecture, what does micro mean? Right? There's not a dictionary definition of that. Does that mean um, instead of one piece, I need nine pieces or some much larger number? Who knows? You have to decide that. Uh, and you're probably going to be wrong uh, the first time. It's going to take some experience and some time to kind of um, tune for your problem space um, what the right answer is. Um, uh, you have to figure out how all these pieces are going to talk to each other. Right, so which piece is going to talk to which piece is going to talk to which piece? It's going to be sort of a tangled web until you've sort of observed how this all works together. You're going to have a thought on how that works, but it's going to be much more complex in practice, and it's going to be hard to even figure out, um, you know, at runtime which pieces are talking to which pieces. Um, there's all these arrows going from box to box. Like, well, what's that arrow? Right. Well, microservice A talks to microservice B. Cool, but like, what does that mean? What is that arrow? Well, it's the network. All right, it's the network, but like. What protocol? Well, you know, it's REST or say HTTP or whatever. Cool. What's in the payload, right? What is there? Um, is it is it JSON? Is it is it Thrift? Like, what is it? And by the way, what's going to happen when you change it, right? Is everything going to explode? What's going to happen when you have different versions of the application? These are really hard problems, and and we're still just at the boxes and arrows part of this. Um, these are decisions that you have to make, and these decisions have significant implications on how you design your application. Um, Forward compatibility, backward compatibility, these are things that you have to think about early. Deployment becomes harder, right? Once upon a time, uh, you know, LFTP or your PHP scripts up to the server, drop the mic, you're finished. Um, sites deployed. Um, but when you've got to put things in, you know, nine different places or 90 different places, your deployment uh, world is much, much more difficult. Um, just in terms of sheer numbers, and sure, there's a bunch of cool whiz bang technology that I get advertised about 100 times a day that's going to make all this easy and take all the complexity. Um, away, but you still have nine things to worry about instead of one. Um, that's a much harder deployment challenge. 
oh, by the way, uh, it's actually much harder than that because you don't just have a production environment, you have all these other environments. So, um, so that adds another multiplying effect. And by the way, that's starting to get expensive over there on the right-hand side. Uh, it's not just about deploying your application. You've got to manage the stuff that's running your application. Um, and whether you're using a cloud provided sort of containerization service or you're managing all this yourself, you have to make sure that you can manage it, right? Something goes wrong and I've got to go patch 50 servers right away because there's some, um, some horrible bug. I better be able to, I better know how to do that, right? If I don't have mastery of operational automation, I probably haven't earned the right uh, to be having this many pieces in my architecture. Um, you're probably better off if you can only, you know, manually manage your server and, uh, and do your, 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 your app get upgrade on, on one server at a time by SSHing into it. You should probably stick with uh, a smaller number of pieces because uh, uh, you need skill and talent uh, in, in operations to be able to do this um, responsibly at scale. And it's obviously way harder when you can't take down time and you need to roll everything. Um, knowing when it's broken is really easy when you have a monolithic uh, architecture. It's either working or it's not. And everything's working or everything's not, generally speaking. Uh, when you have a microservice architecture, it can be kind of broken. And that sounds like a subtle difference until you have to go figure out which piece is kind of broken, right? That's actually really hard. If you're gonna go and manually spot check all of those, um, that's gonna take a ton of time. Um, and again, this is just all complexity that functional programming is, is, is going to save you from none of this stuff. These are all really, really hard things you have to figure out, no matter what language you're using, no matter how good the language is. If you uh, invent some language that's 10 times better than everything else, um, all of these are still problems that you have to solve. Um, failure tolerance. Okay, so you go from one thing to 50 things, right? If there's, if there's a probability of failure uh, on each of those things and you have 50, um, your probability of failure is going to be dramatically higher than if you have just one thing, right? So, um, so that means that something is going to fail a lot faster than if you just had um, one thing, because there's more things that can fail, right? It's pretty basic math. So, um, so that means you have to design for failure tolerance uh, really, really early in the process. So I can't just have services A, B, C, and D running on one machine, because if that machine goes down, I just killed four services. Uh, and that machine's going to go down because you have more pieces, right? So you can't uh, you can't manually just deal with that. So you have to have multiple versions of those services running on multiple uh, on multiple pieces of, of hardware um, to avoid that. Um, there's a more subtle form of failure, which is actually uh, as common or even more common uh, in a lot of architectures that I've seen, which is um, an issue uh, of isolation. So great, I've got my failure tolerance, right? I've got um, two copies of everything running on these machines, but um, what happens when service A starts spinning out of control and taking all the resources from services uh, B and C and D, right? You need some reliable mechanism for getting good isolation um, or that's going to dominate the machine and make that it's kind of broken situation almost impossible to diagnose because you can't tell what's what. And by the way, when that happens, uh, that usually is what happens next, right? It's going to spill over to the other server um, and then uh, you're going to be um, in a mess for a few hours right, while you're trying to figure out what's actually broken. Um, uh, there's also a hard problem, which sounds like the easiest problem in the world, which is where is surface A, right? If I've got this, you know, this mesh of different places where I can run software, um, how do I find this service, right? Where is it? It's kind of like it's over there, um, but that might change, right? Maybe we're going to patch the operating system um, and that's going to go from that machine uh, to that machine. Uh, or maybe this, you know, this thing just failed a health check um, and it gets spun out um, and it's coming up somewhere else. And this is all dynamically happening for, for all sorts of good or bad reasons. Things fail, um, upgrades happen. Question? Yeah, uh, before you finish, I want you to hear about um, two things is distributed database and is you program against that in, in Clojure and also like MapReduce. If you're, in the, if you're in, the, in big scale, you need some, something like MapReduce. Yeah, so, um, so the question is, do you use distributed databases um, or do you use MapReduce or other kind of batch programming paradigms um, in Clojure? Um, uh, yes and yes, but those aren't mandated by Clojure. So um, that depends on what kind of problem you're solving. In our case, we're solving a very at scale problem. So we are dealing with uh, distributed databases uh, and we are dealing with uh, large scale batch program. We use Spark rather than, rather than you know, MapReduce or, or classic Hadoop uh, programming models. Yes, we use, yes, we write our, our, our Spark jobs in Clojure. There's some interop um, layers that, um, uh, that allow us to, to, to do that. So um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier, about 90% of our code all up is written in Clojure. So uh, if we're writing anything of, of, of any weight, front end, back end, um, or in between, it's, it's, it's written in Clojure um, or Clojure scripts. Um, 
So, uh, so I've got to find where the service is, and that's that's a moving target as as services are getting rolled and as things are changing in the environment. Um, but I also have that kind of what happens if this version of the service isn't running as well for reasons, right? Anybody who's run you know several hundred or several thousand machines in the cloud uh, knows that if you get um, 500 m4.mediums, not all of them are going to have the same performance characteristics, and they're not all going to have the same performance characteristics at the at, at different times of the day, right? These things are a little bit moving targets, even though you kind of know what, what you're starting with. So you might just have one service that's working fine, it's passing your health checks, but it can't process data as fast, right? So if you have multiple versions of this, you can't just round robin, that's actually too naive, that's too simple. Uh, you have to actually um, take into account what's happening in that service to know where to route traffic. So it's not just to find the service, it's how to actually route to the right instance of the service. None of these are trivial problems and functional programming um, doesn't solve any of those. Um, so to be clear, I'm talking a lot about this because um, you know we uh, built this startup and we said from day one, we're gonna build it on functional technology and Clojure and Clojure has all these great benefits. Um, but then this is where you spend all your time, right? Because we chose um, to, to, to indulge in this, in this microservices architecture. And, um, you know, I, I guess, spoiler alert or TLDR, um, we struggled. We had to work through these problems and all of these things that I'm mentioning are things that we had to come up with solutions for. And, and we tried to, of course, you know, take good practices from off the shelf when we could, but uh, these were our problems to solve. These were our, um, uh, these were our challenges uh, at the end of the day. And we needed to adapt all that to our environment. It was about a year before we looked back and said, I'm so glad we did this. Um, and so now being you know, two years and change into the business, it's like, I'm overwhelmingly excited that we went and solved all these problems because it's helping us to move really, really fast. Uh, you know, we're building code as fast as we ever had, um, even normalized to kind of an individual developer uh, basis because we have this architecture that allows us to move really, really fast and things are broken apart in code bases and any part um, in any module kind of stay small. But it was a huge investment in complexity. Um, uh, in a monolith, things that, uh, you know, basically everything I just talked about in terms of where to find the service and which version of the service and what's the protocol, all that stuff is just a function call, right? It's unbelievably simpler, several orders of magnitude simpler. So um, I think I see a lot of people kind of diving into these microservice architectures thinking, oh, it's fine. There's like some module I'll add in my language of choice and it's all going to be easy and it's all going to be solved for me. That's not the way it works. Um, so tying this back to, to Clojure, one of the amazing things about Clojure, I talked about that knob, is this dynamism. And, and, and Clojure is very REPL oriented. It's very much about you dive into the REPL and you just start changing stuff and the world changes. It's an incredible uh, programming experience. It's really fun to do uh, and it works great in the small. Um, but when you build a microservices architecture, this is probably where you start, where you end up saying, well, I've got these seven different things that need to run. So I'm going to open up seven different terminal windows and run each service manually. And each of those is a REPL for that service. And that starts to get uh, extremely unwieldy um, as you can probably imagine. And so again, this is the trade-off. This is where all these exciting uh, and, and valuable things that are, that are truly great about functional programming start to collide with the real world, right? You're, again, you're dominated by the complexity of the fact that you have seven things to run. Uh, and this is a real screenshot. This is actually our code running. So once upon a time, this was sort of the way we did things. Um, and then that stopped working because it was just, it was too complex. So we said, how do we simplify this? So we said, all right, let's take our laptops. We had, you know, companies only two years old. So all of our laptops were pretty good. SSD, 16 gigs of RAM. Let's just split them in half. Let's take eight gigs of that RAM and make a vagrant machine. Let's make that vagrant machine just look, look just like our production machines. And then we'll deploy our services into that vagrant machine. So that'll just kind of like run them. And in fact, let's take that one step further and let's apply the same operational automation tools that we use to stamp out things in the cloud and just run that locally. And that had some nice benefits, right? So that means that everybody on the team is constantly running your automation scripts. So uh, the stuff that sets up all the services that you need and configures them, like everybody kind of gets to know that a little bit. Um, obviously then you don't need to go and manually spin up all these things in the REPL, they're just kind of running. And that works okay, right? That's, an, that's certainly a, a usability improvement. Um, the problem is you're building more stuff, you have more services, and eventually um, you're gonna run out of memory, right? And, um, and at some point, um, especially when you're dealing with a completely different virtual machine that's got its, own, um, got its own kernel and its own sort of baseline, you've got all this stuff stacked up, it's not very efficient. And, and again, so yeah, you're getting this nice benefit of running stuff like it's in production, but you're not in production. You have half of a laptop running through a virtualization layer. So 
it worked for a while, but then it stopped working pretty dramatically. So we said, all right, let's do something different. Instead of um, using Vagrant, which has has you know some some heavyweight properties, let's just build a better version of that seven REPLs at a time, and let's run all of those REPLs um, sort of in one REPL. So you have kind of this meta REPL, and this was like cool, and uh, this increased our headroom a little bit more, and so now we could build more services. But predictably, uh, it ends the same way, right? Because you just keep building more and more services. And, uh, and again, there's just one machine is eventually going to run out of the ability to run all these different individual things, no matter how efficient um, you get. And you can, you, know, you can keep going and, 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 try, and um, try and buy bigger machines or whatever. But at some point, you're, um, you're, you're going to start on fire. Um, it's just a matter of how long it takes. So, so at some point, and again, this was all in that first year while we were really trying to figure out how we were going to get this thing to work. Uh, we accepted the reality and said, look, the only way to really make this work and to make it scalable and run over time is to, is to build in a shared development environment. And so, you know, that's kind of obvious, right? So now you have the cloud, you've got a bunch of different infrastructure that you can use, and, um, and now you have plenty of resource to run everything. But of course, you're not going to give everybody um, their, you know, little cloud army um, for them personally. That would be wildly expensive, especially on a startup budget, right? Which part of the hesitation <laughs> for, for doing that up front. Um, and it is chaos right when it's actually shared that first word is important this is shared so everybody's deploying all of their code here so um, obviously there's teams working on service a and d and i and it's breaking because it's development right they're working on the service and so when you're trying to build a system where everything needs to talk to each other um, you just sort of deadlock immediately um, so we adapted this and 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 this is complex and and, and again this is just you know this is uh, uh, repeating the point, but I think it's so important that functional programming is not going to get you out of this mess. There's nothing functional programming is going to do to help here when this is the inherent problem that you're trying to solve. Um, now, fortunately, we do have some tools. We actually use um, something that, uh, that comes uh, from the Scala community called Finagle, which is a, a really a great piece of technology, which I uh, strongly recommend using, whether that you're using that uh, uh, directly or via a proxy. Um, like Linkerd, which is uh, uh, those types of systems are increasing in popularity and kind of extend um, Finagle to environments where you don't have uh, direct interop with, with Scala code. Um, but Finagle has a, a capability that basically allows us to build these little shadow versions of services. So what we can do is take these sort of normal versions of the services and keep those relatively stable. And then when somebody's um, you know building their service and churning it and kind of um, you know uh, destabilizing it by changing it, um, they can sort of put them off to the side, right? So um, everybody can use the stable version of H who's talking to H um, in this diagram, but the team that actually works on H, they have these little shadow H0, H1, H2 that can kind of live off to the side and be deployed into the same infrastructure. And you're probably thinking, that's cool, then they can like sort of talk to H0, but like how, right? You've got this graph of calls, how do you actually like, you know, how do you like, intercept the call in D and tell it that you want it to go to H0 instead of H. Don't you have to, you know, wouldn't you have to also deploy a custom version of D, um, D0 that knows how to call H0, right? Uh, and that would be possible, but kind of really messy, right? Especially if you had a long dependency chain. So um, fortunately, Finagle gives us the ability, um, it basically puts a little request header um, in, each of your, um, in each of your calls, and it allows you to put a per request override. So this is a very simple concept that's super powerful in practice. So basically what I can say is, um, you know, if, if a normal person is calling um, service A, uh, which calls service G, which calls service H, they're gonna get to the stable version of service H. But when I make requests, and only for this request that I'm making, I, want, I have this little override here that says, anything that's trying to contact service H, reroute that to service H1. Uh, and this is called a delegation table. Very simple concept that's super powerful in practice. And so then for my request, when G says I want to call H because of that request header gets overridden and it goes to H1. So I can have my own unstable little service that only affects what I'm doing. And so even if I'm working on a large team um, with other programmers who are modifying H, um, even then we can all have our, our, our own versions of H running in this infrastructure. Question? Will do, yeah. Yeah, so, so great question. So where is this table? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So um, this table is actually in the request header. So at my origin point, basically in my, uh, in my REPL that's making the request to A, that might be kind of the origin point into this, into this whole mess. 
I'll basically set a header that says, hey, I'm making this call knowing that when you get to H, I want to go to H0. So I'm actually going to just make that part of the call to A. It's part of the payload on this arrow. Back to that point of the, the specifics of the arrows matter a lot. And that's going to automatically, because of the underlying technology, because of Finagle, it's automatically going to propagate through the call graph on a per request basis. So it's totally isolated from everything else. Uh, and of course, it's a small amount of data, right? So, so this is just a simple overlay, a, a little bit of text. It's not, you know, going to impose a lot of performance so overhead. Calls up itself, that will still have the header. It'll still have the header. That's exactly right. It'll still have the header. Yep. Um, and this gets even better. We've uh, we've done some interesting networking tricks. And so, yeah, it's cool that I can deploy into the environment my own version of H0 and then myself on a request basis or others, uh, maybe people that I'm working with can also override, override their request to H0. Um, but what if I'm like really working on it dynamically, right? And again, back to one of the really cool things about closure and functional programming is the ability to dive into the REPL and change code and see it happen. If I've got to put a deploy cycle in between that incredible dynamism and the ability to see the results, I've sort of ruined closure, right? I've taken one of the best things about closure and ruined it. So, um, so we created a mechanism to actually boot up a REPL that's running the service and override the request like into the REPL. So I can sort of trap that request, do whatever. And again, I can do that just for my request. That's not messing with anybody else's workflow. So um, super, super powerful. Um, there's some complexity in getting this working and, and, uh, um, and, and you, have to, you have to pay that cost. There's the, this doesn't come for free. There's nothing you can sort of take off the shelf that's gonna you know, route to your REPL. Um, but these are the sorts of things you need to do uh, to continue uh, to get the value from, from functional programming um, that, that you may want to. Um, you know, we, we talked about uh, isolation um, and uh, the specific way that we do isolation uh, is just basic. It's with it's Mesos and containers. So um, we use containers um, and, uh, and we don't use Docker, which probably seems weird because a lot of people think containers and Docker are the same thing. But um, what we want is isolation. Docker has some cool stuff. I really like Docker. We actually use Docker for some um, internal things that we do on, on dev laptops to run some supporting services when you are running a service in your REPL, so you don't always have to, um, to go into a shared environment. Docker is great, um, but in production, we don't really need Docker. Um, we don't need a layered file system. Um, all of our stuff runs on the same stack. All of our stuff runs on the same uh, version of the JVM. So we just need less than Docker provides. Docker is more isolation than we need. Uh, we talked about the other component of, of, of isolation right when a service starts taking too much resources. So um, for each of our resources, and again, you can see them declared here, we, we say for each service what resources are required. Uh, and uh, if those resources are exceeded, we kill it. Uh, we just kill it. And, and, and again, we've designed for this failure tolerance up front. So uh, if a service starts misbehaving, we kill it. That gets alerted and we know about it. It's OK. Um, we don't mind uh, if, if the service goes away um, because there's another version of the service there to, to take the request. But that's usually an indicator that either we need to tweak the operating parameters um, uh, or we need to, to maybe make a change in the way the service is working um, to get back down. And that's important for capacity planning. Um, as much as the vendors will say, just throw machines at it, that's usually a good way to sell you more servers. Uh, monitoring becomes incredibly important uh, in an environment with this complexity. Fortunately, one of the best monitoring tools out there is called Remon, uh, and Remon's language is Clojure. So um, second, second Clojure snippet I've showed you today. Um, so, uh, so Remon's very powerful. Basically, spill all your events um, into one place, and you have this sort of global view of how your system is operating. Um, uh, looking ahead, and I'm going I'm to move quickly here in the interest of time, um, how do we keep it functional, right? So we've built this, we've built this company, um, and, uh, and it's working, right? We're two years in, and, and, and things are going well. I'm happy we chose Clojure, um, but that's not necessarily going to, to remain true, right? Clojure, uh, or whatever functional language uh, uh, you choose for your own startup, needs to continue to grow, right? We need ecosystem. There's a bunch of stuff that we want to use, and we don't want to be the only company in the world. Um, who's building all the closure specific ecosystem. Um, we also need tools. I think this is one thing that anybody who loves functional programming, we all kind of realize that the, the language as a tool um, is, is wonderful, but the actual tools that sit around that aren't always up to par with some of the things that the more mainstream languages have because they have more developers and there's more um, companies making great tools for that. So, um, you know, fortunately, functional programmers have a lot of great volunteers who build cool things, but, you know, the reality is the best environment for writing closure is still Emacs. And, you know, that probably um, should not be the case five years from now if we're going to have thousands of people writing closure um, uh, for, for our um, hopefully wildly successful company. Sure. 
It does. It does. And that is the trade off. So the point being made is it does help with with finding smarter people. If it's a little tougher to use, you do kind of raise the bar. It's true. Um, it is true. Uh, and yes, there are still people at our company who don't use Emacs. People use Vim and people use um, uh, Cursive. There are other options. But yeah, they've got to be sort of those people who like customizing their own tools. This isn't a Visual Studio type workflow. Um, cool. So, so that's my time. Uh, questions kind of came up along the way. And I think in, uh, since there's another presentation, um, uh, do we have time for questions? OK, yeah, just a couple minutes. For Speak in the mic, though. I'll repeat it. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so so you just gave us the sales pitch. Like, what was the what went wrong? Um, what was what was really bad about closure? Um, I don't think there's been anything really bad. I think one of the one of the tougher areas that that we've experienced um, uh, is a specific type of interop, and and uh, and it's been interop with Scala and and, and around Spark in particular. Um, that's been more challenging than we'd like, and, and that relates to that ecosystem point. So um, there exist adapters so that we can write um, to Spark with Closure. Um, and, and, you know, in effect, we had to fork that and kind of take that on ourselves. And, and, and the reason for that is uh, Scala is a really powerful language and it has lots of uh, really cool extensions to Java, uh, but that makes the interop story a little bit trickier um, uh, versus if you're interopting from closure to pure Java, it's extremely straightforward because Java is a very simple language and um, everything is sort of plainly expressed in the bytecode. So, so Scala um, is a little bit tougher and sometimes you have to build little adapters in, in Scala to make it a little bit easier to interrupt through. Uh, it's not a major like world stopping issue, um, but I would say uh, certainly there's a case to be made if, uh, you know, if you're going to be writing tons and tons of Spark code, if, if, if uh, Spark was 80% of the code that, that we wrote instead of, you know, 10 or 15%, then I think Scala would probably be a better choice um, uh, given that. So um, a dynamically typed language uh, with a bunch of parentheses that you have to balance. And I think I just heard you say that Emacs is the current standard. <laughs> so with no help from a compiler, um, how do you stay productive uh, in the midst of human error and syntax errors? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of great tools that aren't specifically compilers that provide some of the same functions. Obviously, writing tests is the uh, is the obvious one, which which you hear a lot. But, uh, you know, there's linters, there's uh, uh, there's things that can do syntax checks and things that can run very quickly to catch obvious mistakes. Um, in practice, uh, balancing parentheses manually is something that nobody really does. There, there exist ways of doing structural editing like um, par edit and there's uh, uh, things like par infer that make the parentheses sort of automatic. So um, uh, having unbalanced parentheses takes a lot of effort. You have to sort of intentionally do that. Those are actually pretty easy things. Other than that, it's the same uh, in enclosure as in, in any other language uh, in terms of those kind of core and fundamental trade-offs. The, the last point I'd make that is closure specific is so much of the work that you do in closure is exploratory. You're inside the REPL. You're kind of touching your code all the time. And so um, I think while certainly um, and, and let's be clear, I, I'm, you know, no, I'm not anti-type by any stretch of the imagination. I think types are useful. It's a trade-off, like, like almost anything. Um, uh, but the ability to have that complete dynamism and that, and that dynamic dispatch, especially when you're in the REPL and swapping things out without having to kind of you know, rebuild the whole, um, uh, the whole sort of function call tree is, is, is really, really powerful. Um, and it helps you move, move faster. So um, I would say you know, types, are, types are great, but they, they come with trade-offs. I, uh, pr probably not specific to the closure, but you mentioned about the Spark. So the, do you manage the Spark cluster by yourself or you use something like EMR or Kubol or any other things? Yeah, Thanks. Um, yeah, we've, we've experimented a lot. And um, uh, so the question, um, if it didn't come through the mic well, is uh, do you run your own Spark cluster? Um, historically, we have. Um, so you know, 95% of the time we've run our own. We have done some experimentation with other things. Uh, we've built our own auto scaling layers and there are some other tools that, that have capabilities around there. Um, they didn't have the flexibility we needed. We did a lot with spot instances and some other things that, um, you know, the, the tooling that sort of did some of that stuff for free wasn't mature enough, but um, that's not advice not to use those things. I think just at the time we were using them, they weren't quite as mature as we like, but uh, uh, yeah, there's a decent chance I could see us in the, in the relatively new future using something like um, EMR Kubold, one of those uh, pieces of, of tech that kind of makes that stuff easier. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs>